Uh, I'm really uh, happy to present our our next speaker here today. Uh, we have Jake Brownscombe, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow with the Banting Scholarship Program here at Dalhousie University with the Ocean Tracking Network. Uh, Jake and I have worked together for many years. First met uh, in a crazy trip to Brazil in 2014, where we did some research on snook together in uh, the Cananea estuary. And since then, Jake and I have worked very closely for uh, the better part of the decade on various questions related to fish tracking and accelerometry and scientific questions. Uh, Jake did his PhD at Carleton University with Steve Cook and, uh, and moved down to, to Florida to study permit. And not that kind of permit, but the fish. Uh, so he's doing a lot of work tracking, uh, tracking these fish down in, in Florida, and Jake's done a lot of thinking about uh, some of the, the fundamentals of telemetry and science uh, and how different, uh, how different approaches work and, and really thinking critically about uh, the way that we're implementing a lot of the, the tools that we have. So this is a, a really important presentation that's uh, going to touch on some fundamentals of uh, array design and testing that have huge implications for uh, the way that we're conducting our research. So appreciate you coming, Jake. Thanks so much. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. I assume that clapping was for Robert. I haven't done anything yet. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Huge thanks to OTN for, for putting this on and for having me, um, supporting my travel out here. A special thanks to Rob and Kim for putting this together. It's a fantastic workshop and a, a really great group of people. So I feel very fortunate to be here and, and spend time with all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk today. We're going to do, I'm going to talk to you for a little while, and then I've got some R code. And it's all sort of based around this paper that we came out with uh, towards the latter half of, of last year, um, where we aim to develop a more tractable and easy to implement um, practical approach to, account, to measuring and accounting for variation in the performance of, of telemetry systems to help to avoid the performance of the system, which is changing over space and time, from influencing the patterns that we're trying to pull out of the actual ecology of the animals. And so before I dive into that, I want to uh, talk really quickly about uh, collaborative data analysis, too. It's something that we're not, isn't really being covered a whole lot in this, in this workshop. But from my perspective, it seems like many of us analyze data where we have a single individual working with all of the data in an R script that goes into a manuscript, and then all of the co-authors review the manuscript, but very few co-authors tend to review the actual analysis and the R code. And there's huge, huge potential for errors during that, in the, all that processing of the data. And so what I've started to do is go over to using GitHub and using that to remotely collaborate with my collaborators. Um, it's a really fantastic forum for doing it because it interfaces directly with R. You can push and pull the R code and data in and out of GitHub and work with your collaborators remotely for that. And there's also version control. So any single collaborator can't mess up the data set too badly. <laughs> and so if this is something that you guys are interested in, you want to get set up with it, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Just t come talk to me afterwards. Um, and John knows a lot about people at OTN know a lot about how to use GitHub and how to collaborate. So it's really quite handy. It's something I'd encourage. So back to the um, detection efficiency stuff. This is not the most glamorous part of telemetry, but I think something very important and something that we often ignore or don't know what to do about. And so last year we also came out with this paper where we outlined what we consider to be the, the most important considerations for, I'm going to go out of camera a lot, um, for telemetry analysis. And Nathan did a fantastic job of covering a lot of these basics yesterday. The, the part that we're going to focus on today is in accounting for system performance. We know, there's lots of discussion of this yesterday, that for various reasons, all of the transmissions that get sent from a tagged animal in proximity to a receiver may not actually get fully um, decoded and, and measured and, and saved by that receiver for various reasons. A big one is physical obstructions, and these can vary a lot over time. So you might work around uh, places with seasonal vegetation or... Um, Changes in, 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 you might have ice cover for part of the year. 
So things that are changing the, the ability in line of sight from between the tag and the animal um, might change over space and time. Uh, you also get code collisions. So the more animals that are in your system in proximity to uh, the, the receiver, the actual less detectable other animals are. And this is the case for Vemco equipment anyway because it's operating all on the same frequency. There's other systems that, that get around this, of course. And then, of course, environmental noise is a huge one. The systems I work in in tropical, uh, snapping shrimp and fish calls are a huge one. Um, you also get influences of abiotic factors like wind. Wind is a massive one in currents. And then you have anthropogenic sources, things like boats driving by. These are all impacting the performance of, of receivers over space and time. This is just an example. Uh, the, the Vemco TX receivers now record um, some mean value of noise in millivolts. And so we have some, our sort of extended team has some receivers on the Florida Reef Tract. And so this is just an example of how the, the noise values vary seasonally. We get these really interesting peaks in the summer, which I think are probably associated with biological activity, whether it's shrimp or, or fish occupying this site. Um, and so this has potentially huge impact on our ability to measure whether fish are there or not. You have almost twice the amount of noise in the summer as the winter. So if you get twice as many detections in the winter than the summer, are they really using it twice as often in the winter? Or is it just the noise that's, that's influencing it? To add to this complication, we can't seem to use noise directly to account for detection efficiency variability. So this is the relationship between that noise metric on the x-axis and the number of detections that we're getting from stationary transmitters in the system. And there's actually quite a poor relationship between it in this case. I don't know why. I was talking with a few different people about this yesterday. Um, it's clearly there's something else going on, at least in this system. That means detection efficiency varies independent of noise for other reasons. It could potentially be wind or this, the, how smooth the surface of the water is that's reflecting signals. I don't, I don't know for certain. Or perhaps this noise metric isn't comprehensive enough in the current uh, VEMCO uh, metrics to, to, to measure the actual uh, impact on detection efficiency. The reason why we need to control for it is really well illustrated by this paper led by Nick Payne in 2010. I encourage you all to check it out if you have not yet. It's a decade old now. But they, they were tracking uh, cuttlefish and looking at their use of nearshore areas. And they decided to put out some reference tags in their system and what they found was that the raw detections would have suggested they were using nearshore areas the most during the day. But in fact, when they accounted for system performance in detecting the reference tags, they were actually more using nearshore areas at night. So this is an example where you could completely misinterpret the dial patterns of space use in an animal because of the system performance. The question still remains, how do we measure system performance over space and time? That, that pain example, they they threw out some re uh, reference tags in their system, but there isn't, wasn't a standardized way to measure performance of all the receivers over both space and time. Where, how many reference tags do you put out? Where do you put them? And how does that actually derive some kind of measure that you can apply to your detections to correct them? The typical approach to measuring detection range, detection efficiency, is, is well um, illustrated with this example, but, um, where Many studies in the past have gone out and put reference tags that are just in stationary positions at set, set distances from the receiver. And then you, they are constantly pinging away and you can measure detection efficiency over time. And it gives you plots like this. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of, a lot of different, a lot of, there's a range, there's a huge variability in the detection efficiency over space and time in this system, as we see across all telemetry systems. And um, despite knowing that this is important, uh, Steve Kessel led a study in 2014 that assessed how well telemetry studies were accounting for system performance in their analyses. And basically what they found is that the vast majority of them scored very poorly in this. So this is something that as a community we don't seem to be doing a very good job of to date. And so our thought was if we could come up with something that's a little more tractable and simple, logistically, practical to, to use, people might start using it more. And so we came up with this paper last year in Methods in Ecology and Evolution that represents, it's a flexible framework and you could do the bare minimum or you could do more if you have more time, if you have more resources, financial and time. 
But this represents what we thought would be sort of the bare minimum example of how you might account for performance over a space and time. And I would like to point out that it may not necessarily be always important to do this. For example, if you're just interested to know if your animals are emigrating from an area and how many of them do that, you might care about detection range in designing that gate of receivers so you know how far to space them. But you might not necessarily be too concerned with correcting for detection efficiency over space and time in every situation. But if you are interested in spatial and temporal patterns of animal space use, this is clearly a relevant thing. So this is basically the framework that we came up with. So you take your, your acoustic receiver array in yellow, those receivers, and you pick a set of sentinel sites. These are going to be sites where you're going to do some range testing and monitor detection efficiency over time. So you should select those sites um, that represent, this is a, it's a very important that you select sites that represent the entire range of conditions across your system. Because you're going to develop a model based on those sites and, and then make predictions throughout your entire array about what detection efficiency is like. And so you need to capture all those conditions, all the different substrate types, different water depths, potentially different uh, fetches and um, angles towards the wind, for example. So this is our array in the Florida Keys. This is Key West right here, big party town. Um, and we selected, we have all our receivers out here, we're tracking a bunch of different uh, coastal fish species, and we selected these nine refer or sentinel sites across our array that in some part were just, we tried to capture all the different conditions, but was also logistically feasible for us to go out and do a lot of, a lot of this stuff. At each one of those sites, the very first thing that we did was conducted a range testing protocol. And we used a very, very basic one where we went out, we tried to find the calmest, most ideal conditions, so uh, high tide, very low wind, and we just took a, a range testing transmitter that's pinging every 10 seconds and put it off the side of the boat for a couple of minutes at a whole range of distances from these sentinel receivers. And what you get from that is this. You get a relationship between distance from receiver and detection efficiency. You know how often the tag is pinging, you know how many of those, those pings got picked up by the receiver once you've downloaded it, and you can plot out the, these, this relationship. I then fit that, those relationships with a third order polynomial with the uh, set x or y intercept at 100. And using that, um, that model, I'm able to predict the maximum range, which I perceived as being where five detection efficiency is 5%, as well as the midpoint, where detection efficiency is 50%. And the reason that I care about the midpoint is because we're going to place a reference transmitter at each one of these sentinel sites that's pinging away throughout our entire study at that midpoint. And by doing that, the idea is that we're achieving, we're enabling uh, each site to have the same freedom of variance around the mean. We're aiming for that 50% mark. I did not do a very fantastic job of achieving that here, um, which could be for a variety of reasons. Probably more extensive range testing at the start would have given me a more informed, um, better, better informed uh, placement for the, the reference tag. But I still have some measure of how the system's performing over time, uh, variance around that mean. Yeah, Rob? What's the mean freedom of variance standard error? Or Here? How do you define freedom of variance? Can you question? How do you define freedom of variance? Um, so what, what I mean is that the, if, you had, if you had a, a reference transmitter out where the majority of the, of the detection efficiencies are close to 100, that, that reference transmitter can vary a lot downward, but not upward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So they all have the same freedom of variance, the same potential to go up and down and vary over time. Increase in detection efficiency, decrease in detection efficiency. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. <laughs> but it, essentially, it's just setting a, a ceiling of 100%. If you put the tag too close to the receiver, it's just going to hear it all the time. And you're not going to capture that variability that's going on. You put it too far away, it's not going to hear it enough. And you're just going to get a lot of zeros when there's like other things going on in that curve. So you're trying to capture that, the slope of, of this curve. So you can get this, this variance that's going on in here. Because if you're out here too far, you're not going to capture it. If you're in too, here too far, you're not going to capture it, is the idea. Not thrilled with it, but it sort of worked out. Um... So the next thing that we need to do is we need to combine the, um, that initial range testing of the maximum range with the information on how detection efficiency is varying over time to derive some sort of standardized detection range correction factor. 
some equations. I'm not going to get dive too much into these, but essentially at every study hour or any period that you're interested in, you can calculate the detection efficiency variance. So the detection efficiency of the time minus the mean at that at that Sentinel site, um, and then we came up with this equation where essentially we're um, combining that detection efficiency variance metric with the detection range, the maximum range. You then have this DRC. This is, this is the detection range correction factor, the standardized factor that's varying over time and space that you can use to correct your telemetry data. And you can do that in a whole variety of ways. The simplest way would be simply uh, using this equation, divide it by its mean, and then divide the number of detections by that value. That's going to give you some standardized measure of, of the number of detections that's accounting for variation in det uh, detection range. Yeah? What was the ping rate of those sentinel tags? Um, they are, the reference tags are pinging, uh, some, I think, 270 to 330 second range. Okay. Yeah, and understanding those ranges, um, how often you're expecting your detections is very important. And with VEMCO tags, you also need to know that there's a, a ping train interval. And so, if your transmitter is pinging every seven seconds, it's going to take three seconds to actual ping, and so your delay is actually t 10 seconds. You would expect it every 10. That's a really simple example of how you could correct number of detections. I think this is, this, this DRC, this detection range correction factor, could be integrated in all sorts of analyses, and I'll talk about some examples later. So we, in this paper, we applied it to a hypothetical data set just to see how it, it would perform. So we generated a hypothetical data set where detection range varied randomly between 50 and 500 meters. Detection efficiency variance went up and down from negative 50 to 50 percent. And we just simulated zero to 10 detections per hour. And so you can see how this detection range correction factor is derived. It's coming from that maximum range is the main driver of it. And then detection efficiency variance over time changes it up and down. And so this is a unitless measure but it could be considered very similar to meters. You apply the, this detection range correction factor to the number of detections with that equation I showed you before. This is a really simple example. And you can see in some cases, hypothetically, you can get major differences between the raw and the actual detection values, up to over a thousand percent difference. So hypothetically, detection performance and the performance measured and derived with this DRC value could theoretically impact your number of protections quite substantially. The next thing, important thing you need to do is model that DRC value over space and time so that you have a model that you can predict into the rest of your system. Because we don't have the time or resources to monitor detection efficiency at every single one of our receiver sites, this enables us to take that data from the Sentinel sites and predict into the entire system. I do that. I did that with uh, random forest. This is a type of machine learning algorithm. Um, it's random forest in particular, and a number of different machine learning algorithms are really, really handy models in ecology. Uh, something I think is underutilized because they can handle a lot of different types of data that typical statistics cannot. So if you're going to fit a generalized linear model, there's a lot of assumptions about the data, the distributions. You can't include correlated predictors. Whereas random forest can handle all those things. It can handle miss missing data, it can handle small data sets, big data sets, outliers. It's insensitive to monotonic transformation, so you don't really need to worry about log transforming your data, for example. It doesn't make any assumptions about the distribution of the data. Um, and it can, in some cases, be very accurate at predicting. Um, so this is, if you're interested in these, I do have a, a machine learning workshop, applying machine learning stuff in ecology. Uh, you can come talk to me about it afterwards. I think it's on my GitHub page, actually. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on my GitHub page. If you go there, my, name's, my username's Jake Brownscombe. This is also a fantastic paper. Uh, outlines random forest and ecology. And then there's another type of model that's kind of similar uh, called boosted regression trees. It's a little bit of a different approach, but they, they also function very well on ecological data. And this paper is fantastic. It gives you all the R code. To, to fit these models as well. So I fit a random forest to the Sentinel tag data to model that detection range correction factor, that DRC, um, over space and time. And I'm integrating the predictors into this model that I'm interested in the actual fish data. So if I want to know how fish are using my 
different habitats across day and night. I'm going to include, I'm going to include habitat and day and night in my, in my model. And that way I can make predictions at the same ecological time scale as my detections. So I fit this model, this random forest model. I'm not going to get too much into how it actually does it. Um, but these, these are the predictor importance scores. So you have these site-specific factors that are very important. Things like benthos type, uh, water depth, habitat type, and rugosity were the most important predictors. And then these temporally changing ones had an effect, but less of one. These are less important to so tide height, tide state, and dial period. The model is able to describe 76% uh, of the variance in the data, which is not fantastic, but not terrible. Um, I could, you know, you could probably put a lot more effort into the modeling and improve this a bit, um, but it's not doing terrible. So the, now I have this model that can predict DRC over space and time. And so this is just an example. Key West, again, here is on the, your uh, right side. And so I'm able to predict at a bunch of receiver locations that we didn't even measure detection range at, just based on their characteristics and the time period at the time. And so this is just showing that DRC value, the size of the circle, not exactly meters, but consider, could be considered sort of analogous to that. And then it's just colored by habitat type. So you can see, like, for example, this really rugose, tiny channel just hears very poorly compared to this more open, flat sand bank, it's, which makes a lot of sense. So if you're getting, you know, five times as many detections here as here, you got to think a little bit about what that, what that means. Right? You're sampling a much larger area in that habitat type. So you now have this model, you can make predictions, and you've got this correction factor that can be used in a variety of ways to, to integrate into your modeling of animal ecology. In this paper, I just did a really simple example using that equation that I showed, where I just divided the DRC by the mean and then divided the number of detections by that value really simple application and then you see the, the patterns in the, in the raw data in the red compared to the uh, corrected data in the blue and we see some differences particularly they seem to be using the channels which are don't hear very well um, particularly um, during the day apparently because you see the model is now upping the um, its proportional use of that habitat type in the day. I did this with some regret in retrospect because I don't think that this is really the best application of this correction factor to telemetry data. It's a really simple one, and I'm surprised that the reviewers let me away with this. Um, but I think re re realistically, you're probably more interested in using this DRC value in a more complex model. Something like a generalized linear model of presence absence over space and time. You could include that DRC value as a random or a fixed effect in those models, for example. You could integrate it uh, into occupancy modeling frameworks, uh, hidden Markov or state space models. Uh, it could easily be in integrated into those or in the interpolation methods like the COAs that people commonly use, centers of activity, which we just calculated in, in Ryan's workshop. A couple of good papers that describe methods that would easily t like uptake this, this um, DRC value. Uh, this paper led by Joseph Allos, a state space modeling framework that integrates uh, receiver to detection efficiency error, that DRC value can go straight into a state space model like this. this. The interpolation methods, those COAs, this is another great example by Megan Winton, uh, came out a couple of years ago, where she integrates the variation in receiver uh, detection efficiency or receiver performance in those COAs. Again, DRC can go straight into this model, for example. Is that straightforward to everybody, sort of? Makes some sense? Cool. Um, yeah, again, the, all the code for associated with um, that Methods in Ecology and Evolution paper is um, it's online in my GitHub. All the data is available as well. And so we'll go over John. Where's John? <laughs> and pop into R here for a minute. So we know it's so bad, it's the Bay of Fundy Tides, it's 
Mm -hmm. So you got a bunch of Right. Putting as many as we can, and it's still bad. Mm -hmm. um, so, have you ever can it be applied like that, or would you need to calculate it for each receiver? Yeah, you could put a reference tag out in proximity to a group of receivers. The the thing I like about that midpoint approach is you have this standardized measure that you that you can you know apply at a population level of your receivers. Whereas if you have a reference tag at a bunch of different distances from receivers, it's not that it's not a standardized measure anymore. It's hard to know how to combine them. Yeah. What does 50% detection efficiency at 100 meters versus 75% detection efficiency at 200 meters at a different receiver? How do those two jive together and produce some kind of standardized correction factor? Um, so if, yeah, maybe something we could talk about afterwards. Um, and I would like to to highlight the fact that this framework that we came up with is theoretically pretty pretty flexible. So that was sort of like the bare minimum, what we thought you could do. But if you have more time and resources, you could put you know, three or four or five reference transmitters out at each of your Sentinel sites. Um, you do have to think about the fact that you know, we use nine. So we built nine extra moorings, bought nine reference transmitters. If you wanted to use three at each site, now you're talking about 27 moorings and 27 reference transmitters. And you got to think a lot about where you're going to put those three reference tags and how you're going to get a standardized measure across your whole system that can be combined into one standardized correction factor. So all the code um, associated with this method is, is available online through, through my GitHub and you should have, be able to all access it um, through the, the OTN GitHub page. Through Kim's GitHub page. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think you could you could aggregate your data at whatever time scale you're interested in ecologically. So if you're going to aggregate your data by day and night across seasons, that's the number you're interested in, in terms of number of detections with your animals. You could also f calculate the mean detection, the mean DRC value across those same levels and use that as a correction factor. And the nice thing about using the model to predict DRC over space and time is that you're not, if you use the detection efficiency of a reference tag at a certain site as a direct measure, any kind of site specific impacts on that, on that detection efficiency um, might get extrapolated across the whole system. Like if you had a boat go by one site while it was measuring it. And it's not, it's just something that's like a little, um, it's not, doesn't represent like the overall pattern in the system, if that makes sense. So you guys have this, um, this sheet open? Everyone able to access it? Got the, the colored things going, the sheets? So there's a few packages you're going to have to call. If you want to just go ahead and call those, you might have them up already. Um, most of these have been used already. ggplot, ggmap, gganimate, reshape. Um, it's just for manipulating data frames. All that stuff could actually be done in dplyr if you wanted. And then we're going to use a random forest at some point. So there's kind of three um, different data sets here. You've got the, the range te that initial range testing data with that range testing tag. You've got the detection efficiency from those reference tags at each Sentinel site over time throughout our study. I think we, we published two months of data with this. And then you have uh, our detections of permit um, in the Florida Keys. So we'll bring in our reference or uh, range testing data. We can have a look at it. Um, this data has had some processing done to it already. So I've gone in, I think probably just in Excel, and you know, this, this, this number of detections per hour is something that you're going to have to pull out of BRL, right, and actually count, count up the number of detections that you get, and then calculate based on your expected detection rate what that detection efficiency is. So here I've, I've aggregated some information about the site, uh, the distance of the, of the reference transmitter from the from the uh, receiver, the water depth, the tide at the time, and the number of detections we got, detection efficiency based on the number of detections, um, and the um, 
that same value as a, just expressed as a proportion. So if we just quickly plot it um, by habitat type and receiver, just to have a look at what this data looks like. I'm specifying habitat and station as a factor here. Um, it's important to understand the types of variables you have in your data frame because they're going to they're going to um, perform differently with different analyses. So I'm just going to set these two as a factor. Recall ggplot. So this is what our data looks like. You can imagine when I first saw this, I wasn't thrilled. But this is a really a very bare minimum approach to, to, to range testing. You could do this a variety of different ways. Um, you know, we basically spent like less than an hour e at each site. Uh, we did it under ide near ideal conditions. So the idea was that we were trying to figure out what the maximum range is. Um, so I would encourage a little bit more extensive range testing. You could do it off the side of the boat like we did, um, just placing a range testing transmitter. Or you could station a couple of different reference tags for a little bit longer period too. Um, it's good to have a general sense, though, of what your range is to even know where to put those reference transmitters in the first place. Because you could put them all too far away or all too close and not get the right information that you want out of this. So we're going to model this relationship. A lot of the literature will use um, logistic regression to model it. Um, for me, I tried a whole bunch of different ones, and it might be the fact that this data is just a little bit sparse, but it seemed like a third order poly polynomial with a set uh, y-intercept at 100 was the best model. I explained the most variance in this data. And we're going to use that to predict the, the maximum range in the midpoint. We haven't done too much yet. Is everybody, everyone still good? Yeah. So in order to do that, I'm not sure, I don't think we've worked with lists at all in this workshop, have we, Rob? Uh, yeah, so for the network stuff yesterday, I split the data frame by ID and the per map on the last Okay. So first thing we're going to do is just set the intercept at 100. We're going to assume that right beside the transmitter, you can always hear 100% of the time, which I think is a fair assumption. Um, and then... Instead of fitting the model to every single um, receiver station, sentinel st station, uh, like manually and fitting nine different models, we're just going to split the data into a, into a list and then apply the model using LApply to every um, receiver station in that list. And it's going to enable us to just do it very quickly and, and a lot less coding. And so first thing we'll do is make this DF list thing using split by station. So each station is going to become its own object in this list. You can see that now. We have a list of nine things, each of our stations, and the associated data with it. We're then going to apply that third order polynomial with the, with the set intercept. So the negative one, this is the model here, linear model. Um, we're going to, detection efficiency is going to be our response variable. We're going to get rid of the uh, intercept. We're going to fit a polynomial, third order, and then we're going to reset the intercept at the intercept value, which is 100. Whoops. So you now have this result coming out in the models. Again, it's a list, so it's not that useful for us just yet. So L apply is going to um, run over a list and apply the same set of operations to everything in that list. The alternative would be making, redoing, rewriting the model just with a different data frame every time. Yeah, so you could subset your data out and fit this model nine different times if you wanted to, too. But you could imagine, you know, if you had an even bigger array and you had like 20 or 30 sites, you know, lists can be very handy very quickly. Yeah? Hey, I'm sorry if you mentioned this, but you mentioned reference types. Did you use prototyping types to do the same kind of assessment like within a VPS? So you could have like the kind of similar VPS with different environments? 
I think the VPS um, is sort of in its own functioning with having those reference transmitters in it are giving you very similar values to this, this DRC metric that you could model over space and time in the same way. Yeah. So we're just going to format the result. Um, there's some other handy little things in here. Um, so basically what we're going to do is run over that list again and we're going to bind together the outputs um, where we're going to calculate from each model uh, the coefficients, uh, the R squared value, the adjusted R squared, and the AIC value, which I assume you're all familiar with. So we now have this object that's DR res. We'll just make it a data frame. We'll specify the site as the row names, and we can have a look at that. So we now have a, a data frame that has each of our Sentinel sites in it, the, and some of the the information about the models that we fit to, to that relationship between um, distance and detection efficiency. And you can see we're modeling pretty good at most sites. This one we're explaining almost all of the variance. The adjusted R squared compared to the R squared, by the way, is just accounting for the number of variables in the model. So we can make some predictions as well. So we'll generate a new data frame to make some, some predictions onto. So we'll just use the sequence function to generate a new data frame from 0 to 1,000 meters by 0.1. Set the intercept, because the model needs to know the intercept to, um, to make predictions onto. And we're going to use that same LApply framework to make predictions out of our model. Bind those. Um, those predictions back into our uh, original data or distance generated data set. Just have a look at that. So we now have predictions for each site the across distance. It's not in a very useful format though. This is in a wide format and in order to plot it and do things with it we want it in a long format. You can easily do this in dplyr. Um, this is just sort of an art of, I use reshape to do it, but this melt function is just sort of an artifact of, I, knew, I learned how to do this before I was using dplyr. So we'll make this new object. We need to tell it what our measured variables are, which are variables 3 to 11. Where they're going to call dplyr and, and rename our variables to something useful to us. And so we now have that exact same data frame uh, that was in a wide format, just in a long one. We use ggplot now uh, to plot that out. And it's something that I think we're all pretty familiar with at this point. So this is basically that plot from the, from the paper that I showed you in the presentation earlier. Is everybody following along all right? No errors? All right. Um, so we can also, there's also some useful code here. You're going to want to pull out from that model the predicted values for the, M, for the maximum range and the midpoint, because you're going to want to use those two things later. Yeah? I'm just wondering from the, the predictions based on depth, is that the depth of the central tag or up the receiver station? Yeah, um, I use the depth of the receiver. And for the most part, there wasn't any major, major differences in our system that way. Um, the placement of that reference tag is, is really important, especially if you're just, just going to use one. Um, there's potential for biases to creep in there. If you're not picking a spot in the detection range of that receiver, that's representative of the general detection range. So for example, if you're sitting on a slope and you put it up on the top of the slope, it might hear the tag very well, but it might hear down off the slope very poorly. And so the variation that's occurring in that detection efficiency of that reference tag doesn't represent the actual variance that's occurring in that area. And so if you have a really complex system, you might consider using more reference tags or put a lot of careful thought into where you're going to put it that would be representative of the overall range. And again, if you have more time and resources, I would certainly encourage using more, more reference tags. Yeah? Do you have like analytical when you have, uh, in terms of like the depth of that reference tag, or you have a benefit gamma, would you just put that tag at depth 
Exactly. Yeah. That's the ecology of the animal is another very important consideration. Yeah. So we're just going to pull out the, the maximum range and the midpoint from this model. And we already have those predictions. So we're just going to pull them. We're just going to filter out the values that are 50 and 5%. Use a little if else statement to just tell it if what what value this is. If it's five, it's going to be maximum range. Otherwise, it's going to be midpoint. And so we now have this data frame that gives us for each one of our stations the maximum range and the midpoint. If you just want those in their own data frame, you can do that. So we'll generate um, midpoint and MR, and you can have a look at those. So these are our midpoint distances. These are our maximum range distances. So you can see in our system because we're dealing with such a shallow, noisy environment, we're really not getting fantastic range. This one only here is 95, 96 meters in, a ma in, the, in the maximum range. So we've gone out, we did our range testing, downloaded our receivers, ran it through this code, and so now we now have these predictions of the midpoint. And so we can go back out and put our reference transmitters at this distance. And you see the distance is different for every single Sentinel site. It's very hard to get exactly 77 meters from a receiver, by the way. And that might be a part of the reason why those means don't come out perfectly like you'd like. And you might need to play around with it a little bit, test it, see how it's doing. Detection efficiency, generally speaking, also goes down over time, especially in places where receivers become biofouled. Um, I like it's not necessarily a homogenous radius. Yeah. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? So where you did your testing, like backing away with the... Oh, with the, that, that linear you line. ...generate your curve. Now you've come up with your distances. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember, oh, we went down the channel or we went up on the flat? Or yeah, that's basically what I did. Put it yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because what's happening between 70 and 96 to drop 45%. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. What's there? <laughs> I want to know what's there. Yeah. It's, it's largely the fact that the further the tag has, the transmission has to travel through the water, the less power it has. Yeah. Once Which it reaches the receiver. So, and. The chemistry, I mean, I'm imagining. Yeah. In, in my case, in my system, I have pretty good straight lines. It's not a physical okay. obstruction issue. It's an environmental noise issue, I think. Okay. And so environmental noise with increasing distance from a receiver has an increasingly high impact on its ability to hear okay. the tag, just because of the power sense. issue yeah. with distance. So the same amount of noise, it just can't hear us. You know, it's at some distance, the noise overtakes it, essentially. It overtakes it, yeah. so, that's what's happening. so that's what you're dealing with then? I think so. So this is just that same plot, but we're just going to add the, um, the midpoint and the maximum range to it. So this is that exact same plot from the paper and that we looked at before in the, in the presentation. Again, I'd encourage doing a little bit more range testing than we did. But if you're really strapped for time and resources, this is kind of a quick and dirty way of, of figuring out what your range is. Code's working for everybody?
So we got that range stuff out of the way. We've now gone out, placed our reference transmitters at each one of our Sentinel sites. It worked out perfectly. You got exactly mean, 50%. Fantastic. So you load that data in. And again, all these data sets are processed to some extent that I'm giving you. And you know, so was Robert's, for example, yesterday. And there is a lot of fantastic resources out there from taking your telemetry data from the Rob format into a more usable format like this. And OTN has a lot of those resources, a lot of that code on their website. So we have this reference, um, reference tag data here. That's, I'm just looking at the structure there. You can also just look at the, the top of it. So for every, for every station and every study hour, we now have, in, we have information integrated on depth, habitat type, tide height, tide state, benthos types, rugosity, and then the number of detections that we got from that reference transmitter. And you can see even in the top few values, it's wildly variable. The amount of variability and elevation on the bond. Um, snorkeling level with the substrate, uh, just a general estimate. So I think I scored it between one and three. One being like totally flat and three being like huge coral heads in massive seagrass banks. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's like people who have more expertise on geography and things would come up with better estimates of slope and things. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she suggested that you take a chain and lay it over the, the bottom and just measure the distance between that the chain stretches from the top down to the bottom. That would give you some estimate of, of the height. I suppose you could use like one of those long measuring tapes too. Something more extensive than, than my general estimates. So when you look at the structure of the data, we need to, um, we're going to model it with the random forests. I think that's what we're doing. Um, so you want to make sure your data is in the right format. And so you, when you, by running this, this structure operation on the, on the data frame, you can look at the different types of variables in your data frame. And so a lot of these things are factors or numeric. Uh, you'll notice rugosity is one, two, three. I, I decided at some point I don't want to treat it as an integer. I want to treat it as a factor for modeling. So I just um, change that over here. This is another really important thing about analyzing telemetry data is to understand the difference between presence only data and presence absence data. So when you take in your data frame and you have all of these study hours, that's only when you actually have detections and data. And so if you want to know information about truly um, animal presence absence over time, you're going to have to generate a new object that is every, every study hour that you're interested in. Uh, summarize your detection data in some way and then bring that over into a different data frame. And then all the NAs that come out in the new rows, those are rows that you don't have data for, so you can make those zeros. So we already know how to work with date time from previous workshops in R. So we're going to quickly make this date time object so we can work with time. can't remember why I made this other rep data to object. We're just going to work with that. Uh, strift time's handy because you can, you can use it to convert your, your date times to different formats. So in this case, we're just interested. We're going to aggregate our data by hour. So you can use strift time to take that date time POSIX object and change the format down to just hour. And then we'll make that a POSIX X, uh, CT object again. And if you run STR on it, You can see we now have um, hour, which just has the hour level information on it. And then we also have uh, date time, which would have more 
more daytime information. So we're now going to use that hour object in this sequence function again to generate a new data frame called date time, where hour in that data frame ranges from the minimum of our data set to the maximum of our data set, and it's going to sequence out by hour. And you look at that, it's already a POSIX CT object, that's fantastic. We now have a data frame that is our whole time frame of our study. And so we want that, need to repeat that time frame for every one of our stations. So we're going to make a new object called stations that's just calling any unique values out of our data frame. And then we're going to use the merge function to merge date, the date time object with the stations object. You can see if you click on it here, we now have every hour for every station combination. So, in order to get our reference, our actual reference type data, the detections, the number of detections combined over into that data frame, the first thing we're going to use is dplyr again, this group by function. We're going to group by hour and station, and we're going to summarize just the number of detections that occurred in each hour and station combination. Look at that. Perfect. This is, again, a presence-only data, data set, right? So that's why we generated that presence-absence data set. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this new object where we're going to merge together that date-time station, which is the presence-absence data set, with the presence-only data set. And there's some other things you can specify with this merge function, and you can see one of those here. Um, all x is true, meaning x is the first object, y is the second object. So we want to make sure that it keeps every level of that presence absence data set as it merges the new one and merges these two things together. And we want to make sure that as it merges, it's going to match the appropriate study hour and the appropriate station. So we now have this ref data for object. Click on the right one. There should be more NAs in this. back to that, I'm not sure. So basically, theoretically, you should get a lot of NAs coming out of this. Any, anywhere you didn't have data in the actual data frame should be at, come out as NAs in the rows. And so this is just a simple little operation to say, let's go inside of this new object. Anytime detections is an, an NA, we're going to make it a zero. Ah, yes, of course. So I'd actually already summarized the data at this point. So this is just sort of an example of how you would do this. But all the detections are going to come out as one in this case because I had summarized the data uh, previously. So it's a little bit confusing. I'm sorry about that. So there's a question earlier about the, um, our tag delay with our reference tags. Unlike the range tags that are pinging really quickly, every seven seconds plus a three second burst interval, so we expect them every 10 seconds with a range tag, but with the reference tags, they're pinging a lot less often and with um, some variability. And the reason that for this is because we're trying to avoid the potential for code collisions. And so if you had, hypothetically, multiple tags in the same area that were pinging at a very high rate and at, and at a very fixed interval, they could hypothetically sync up and be blocking each other's detections every time. So that's why Vemco puts in these random tag delays. So ours is between 270 and 330. You've got to add three seconds to that because of the, um, the burst interval on the tag. And so we would expect between 11 and 13 uh, detections per hour as the maximum expected number. And so we'll assume conservatively, we can have a look at that using this histogram. Quite a few zeros. Zero inflated data sets are always fun to deal with. Um, so we'll assume that 11 or more detections, because of that random delay, we'll assume anything from 11 to 13 is considered to be 100% detection efficiency. So we're just going to 
uh, calculate that out, calculate detection efficiency, assuming 11 is the max. You're going to get some numbers that are above 100% because there's going to be some 12s and 13s in there, so we're just going to make those 100. And if you look at that data set now, there's actually a lot more 100s than there are, than there are zeros. If you look at that, the relationship, the histogram of this over all of the different um, Sentinel site, you can see there's a lot of different relationships and a lot of different variable distributions in the data. And so basically what detection efficiency variance is doing is it's calculating a mean and then it's fig figuring out how the variance in detection efficiency is occurring over time. There might be a better way to do this other than figuring out the difference from the mean, especially with these types of weird and variable, um, variable distribution patterns. So I was going to bounce back and forth between the PowerPoint and, and R for a bit here, but I think that'll be too challenging with the video. So you, as you recall in that in that sort of concept diagram, we now have this detection efficiency variance value for every study hour at every one of our Sentinel sites. And so we can calculate the difference between that and the mean value at each Sentinel site to figure out that the variance that's occurring from its mean. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate means where they're going to back assign those mean values into our original data set and then calculate the difference between the actual detection efficiency at the time and the overall mean value for that, for that station or that sentinel site. I also included some code in here. If, if your mean it gets very far off from 50 and you think it might be affecting your data, this is, there is a, I came up with this standardization approach where you can scale your data back into that plus or, 50, plus or minus 50% if you'd like. So that's, and this is all outlined in that paper, so DEVC is just a slightly, it's a different variation of that DEV value. So in our data set, we now have detection efficiency of the hour, the mean for that receiver, sentinel type, and the variance that's occurring. So in this particular study hour, uh, this receiver was hearing, you know, 32% lower than its average. Again, you have a lot of zeros and a lot of hundreds. Does that make sense, everyone? So you recall we made that maximum range object a while ago based on the range testing data. And so we're now going to take the... Um, we're going to combine over into it um, that distance value from, the, from that maximum range. So we're basically assigning over maximum range into our data set. And so ref data now has not only the variance at the, at the hourly level, but also that static measure of maximum range that came from the, the, range, the ori original range testing protocol. And then as I outlined in that equation on that one slide, this is that equation just operationalized in R. So you got the maximum range plus the maximum range multiplied times this correction factor integrating the, the variance and detection efficiency at the time. And so this, you now have that DRC value. And so this value is what you could take and apply in any kind of modeling framework that you want. You know, you could be a random effect in a, in a mixed effects model, or it could be an error term in a state space model or something. You see the minimum value. So you take that really low range site to begin with, that 95 meter detection range site, and then at a very, very poor detecting time period, it's now down to 47.5. Again, this is sort of a unit, unitless measure, but it might be sort of analogous to meters. 
you want to look at the relationship between that maximum range, the detection efficiency variance, and the derived direct, um, detection range correction factor. I know there's a lot of terms here, I'm sorry. So you can get a sense about how, you know, that's sort of a similar looking relationship to what we saw in that hypothetical data set, right, where you have the correction factor being derived, driven primarily by that maximum range, but also variance occurring around that due to the detection efficiency variance of the reference tag at the time. This is kind of constrained a little bit in the sense that detection, this correction factor can never really get super large or super small. So like if a hurricane camp comes through your study site, like Hurricane Irma did in 2017, probably detectability is zero for a while. But with this method, it's never going to correct down to that level. And so there might be more to be done there to make this a little bit more, to expand the applicability of this to a, little, to a wider range of conditions. Um, again, this is just something that we kind of dreamed up as a starting point, and I'm really hoping that people start to work, keep working on this and evolving it and, and making it more flexible and, and useful. So we have this DRC value, but it's only at our, our Sentinel sites. And that's been very handy for us because we didn't have to measure detection range at every single one of our, we have over 100 receivers in the Florida Keys. Um, we only, so we only measured at nine of them. And so we're going to fit that random forest model uh, to the data and then use that model to predict over our entire array. Or and in this case, a, a subset of the different sites. So we have this ref data object. It's got all the variables that we need to do it. It's got that DRC value. It's got all the, the site-specific information as well as variability over time. And there's, again, this, getting all this stuff together can be tricky, and there is a lot of good R code out there on the OTN website to get from the raw data into this format. So again, uh, rugosity, I already made it a factor before, but it's, this is still in here. This is the time period before you do any modeling where you really want to look at the structure of your data and decide how you want to treat all your, your different variables. Make sure factors are factors and numbers are numbers when you want them to be. So we'll call random forest. And random forest, there is some randomness in them as the name would suggest. And so you need to, in order to not have a different output come out every time you run the model, you want to set a seed. It's just a random starting point for the model. And when the model starts at that random starting point, it's going to give you the exact same output every time. And so it's reproducible for your papers. So you don't want um, to fit a model, put your data out there in your code, and have people going, well, I'm not getting the same output. This isn't reproducible. And so that's kind of an important part of that whole reproducibility and credibility thing in science. And the other great thing to go back to that whole collaborative data analysis thing is if you are doing collaborative data analysis, working in GitHub, pushing and pulling your code and data in and out of the cloud, at some point, if you really want your data to be accessible and reproducible, you can just make that GitHub public at some point, or make a new public one with some, you know, a cleaner version of, of your analysis. And that way, everybody knows exactly what you did with your data, can get reproducible examples. And I, when I look through the literature, I see those papers that do that getting cited a lot more than papers that don't, because they're reproducible examples, and people understand them, and they trust them. Yeah, Rob? Sort of a random question I could have asked you privately, but maybe other people wonder as well. Uh, how do you choose what number for your set seed? I always set this. 12 and 10 are my two favorite numbers. <laughs> Why not just 12? That's the only reason. Your bank's been That's my social insurance, <laughs> insurance number. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of expertise on this. It's I have the exact same answer, so I at least we're on the same page. Yeah. Good. I like 12 and 10. Yeah. I always said 65. <laughs> um, so this is sort of the basic structure of how you can fit a random forest. They're pretty plug and play kind of a model. There's a lot that you can do with them, and there are some broader considerations, and I'd encourage you if you're going to use them to read into some of the caveats and benefits and some of the different examples. Um, but this is just an example of a really simple one. So the first thing we're going to do is just define a formula. 
And I like to do this with all of my modeling exercises because, so Z is going to become a formula that is the model structure. So we're going to model detection efficiency, detection range correction factor, DRC, by habitat benthos, rugosity, depth, dial, tide state, and tide meters. And by defining this formula, you can go through and fit all sorts of different models and just call the formula instead of having, sort of clogging up your code with the, you know, putting the, typing that formula at every time for every model. And so, you know, when I landed on this model, I tried a bunch of other ones too, right? This, I just included the random forest, but the, the formula is, is nice and handy for that reason. We're going to make this object called a ref forest. Using the random forest, this is the random forest package. Uh, there's lots of extensions and different things you can do with this. Um, calling our formula, tell it what our data is. We're not going to, we're going to sample without replacement. And there's a lot to these. There's a reason why I chose that um, in terms of assessing variable importance. If there are any NAs, there shouldn't be. We're just going to omit them. But there's different things you can do. You can um, permutate them if you want to. We're going to calculate variable importance for our predictors. And we're going to fit a thousand different trees. And so what it's doing is it's taking the data, randomly grabbing a set of data and a set of predictor variables, and fitting a decision tree to it. And so it's creating binary partitions in the data over and over again, trying to optimize the prediction of the response. And so it'll take habitat. It'll try to split up different habitats and see how well it can, um, it can uh, explain the variance in the DRC based on splitting at different habitat levels. And then different combinations, different habitats. We're going to split by these habitats and then by these depths. And it just keeps doing that randomly over and over again until it, until it, um, it fits a thousand different trees or however many trees you specify. And then it uses, it, um, uses bagging to aggregate the, all the trees together to optimize the best performing model, the best predictions of your response. And so pretty much like all machine learning, its focus is really on prediction accuracy. And again, there's, I, if you go onto my GitHub page, there is a, a workshop on applying these types of models to ecological data. So we'll fit the model. So it's not found. It's going to take half a second to fit. do I like about random forests over boosted regression trees or support vector machines? The um, random forest is a very nice, well developed set of tools around it for assessing variable importance and making, predictor and making predictions. You can also do really cool stuff with cross validation. So you can do k 10 fold k cross validation in your data, where you're splitting your data into 10 different sets, training based on nine of them predicting onto the other one. And you do that over and over again, and you can partition your data out uh, to a deal with like spatial autocorrelation or temporal autocorrelation explicitly in the random subsetting process, which is really important for things like telemetry data sometimes. So there's a lot of um, utility with random forest models. I find the structure of the splittings to be very intuitive. It's something that people can look at the trees and understand very quickly. Um, and the boosted regression trees are fantastic too. And they can, in some cases, be um, tuned to make better predictions than random forests do because of the way that they fit the data. But there's a lot more tuning and things to know about boosted regression trees to get them uh, to fit well. So random forests is a little more plug and play than boosted regression trees are. So as I mentioned, the first thing that's going to come out when you fit a, a model is the percent variance uh, not explained in the, in the out of bag predictions which is 24%. So if you just run print on that object, this rep, the, which is the model, ref forest, gives you 1,000 trees. It only tried two variables at each split. You can change that if you want. It's going to give you the mean square of the residuals and the percent variance explained. So we're explaining 76% of the variance in DRC based on this set of predictors. And you could, of course, include any ones that you're interested in. Wind might be a really important one as well that I didn't include. 
So you now have this model that seems to be fairly accurate, at least 76% accurate, at predicting DRC. And the important thing to note about this as well is this is percent variance explained in non-training data. And so integral to the modeling process of random forests, because it's randomly grabbing data and variables, it's, um, it's able to, to assess its prediction accuracy in non-training data inherently. And so most modeling processes, what you want to do is split your data up like that k-fold thing that I was talking about before. Because you don't want to overtrain your model on the data. It might be explaining patterns that are specific to that data set and aren't generalizable patterns in the system. And so you really need to test your model on non-training data. And there's lots of different ways to do that. And random forest is nice because it does it inherently. Yeah. The predictors? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm going to forget that every time. <laughs> I was asked, uh, how did I pick those predictor variables? These were ones that, it's a combination of things that I thought would probably affect detection efficiency, as well as what I was interested in the actual ecology of the animal. So I was interested to know whether a permit were using different habitats across different tide states. So naturally, I wanted to put tide state into my to my model so I can make predictions at that ecological scale that I wanted to look at the data at. Um, and there's lots of different procedures. These random forests are actually really great for variable um, selection. And so you can throw, you know, 50 variables at a random forest if you want. And there's different extensions of it that are better at variable selection stuff. There's some kind of some tricks to it. But you can use random forests as a tool to predict your most, to select your most important predictors and then use those in like a logistic regression if you wanted to. If you wanted a more traditional statistical framework where you have p-values, if you don't know which variables to use, random forest is a good one to figure out what your important variables are. And I think, I didn't include this here. Yeah, this is just the importance values. And there's also some native plotting functions for these important values. But again, this is that same table I showed you where we have the different and the way that it's assessing this is basically because it's randomly selecting variables and data, it's, um, it's going to, it's figuring out the amount of error that's incurred in the model by dropping that variable from the model. So each variable isn't used every time it fits a tree. And so it's, it can figure out how important that variable is by seeing the difference between how well the trees perform when that model is, when that variable is in the data versus when it's not in the data. minutes. Yeah. So the question is, the, uh, the invariable important scores as high good? Uh, yes, high is better. High is a more important predictor. Because more error is incurred in the model by, by it not being in there. These are two different metrics. Mean squared error is overall performance accuracy, prediction accuracy. Node purity is how much it's contributing to the individual splits. So it's more related to the actual operation of the model. Everyone's blue. Flip how blue and green everyone stayed this whole time. Um, the last thing we're going to do really quickly is pull in some permit detection data. This is a very small subset of, of my data. Um, don't publish it on me. <laughs> Everyone seems to be scared of that for some reason. Um, again, in order to make predictions with the model, you need to make sure you have your variables in your prediction data set. So we have this permit detection data frame that has all of the same variables in it as the model, or else the model is not going to be able to predict. It needs all those predictor variables in the new test set, and they need to be in the same format. So regossi needs to be changed over to a factor, or else the predictions won't work. We'll just, call, we'll just use predict. Um, we'll use predict based on the ref forest, that random forest model, onto permit detections. So we now have DRC predicted across this permit detections data set. We're just going to summarize it by site just so we can plot it out and see what's going on in the system. GGMAP. So um, if you want to be able to pull satellite images from Google, it used to be very easy. Now you have to register an API with them. 
And so you go online, it's going to scare you because it's going to want your credit card information and you think it's going to charge you, but it doesn't. So I get a bill every month from Google for zero dollars and I pull maps off of their, from them all the time through R. So what you have to do is go get that key, register an API, and you put that key in here and you'll be able to pull maps yourself. Um, what I did was I just included that map as, a, as an RDS file in this workshop. These are particularly useful for me because I work in shallow coastal systems and the satellite images are really very telling of what's going on. So we're going to use ggmap, sort of like an extension of ggplot, and we're just going to plot the uh, mean detection range values that we predicted onto our data set. Okay, similar to that plot that I showed you that's in that paper. If you want to animate it uh, spatiotemporally, uh, we can do that too. We just need to make sure that we have an hourly. Why don't you use our map, Jake? <laughs> I, if I was on my computer, I would show you what our map looks like in the area. It's all the same depth. The entire area is, because it's all less than, than four meters. And so, like, basically the reef drops off, and you get interesting depth contours out there, and then the entire area of the Florida Keys and um, Gulf of Mexico is just one flat area. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, we could have a look at it and see if we can get it working. <laughs> okay. Offer presented. <laughs> um, so, again, we're, we're going to make an hourly ob um, variable here that we're going to plot across. We're going to lawn transform our detections just to plot them. And we're going to subset it for just the first couple of weeks because otherwise it's going to take us forever to animate this thing. So we're going to call ggAnimate. We've already been introduced to this before. Make this P object. I don't know why I always call my pots P. Um, and the only real difference between this and the ggMap is that we now have this transition time, which is that our um, POSIX object. And we're also going to add a title. That's the time frame. Never seen that before. Um, so we have 166. Ooh, why is this weird? We have 166 different uh, hours, and so we're going to make, uh, we're going to animate this with 166 different frames, so that every hour has its own frame. We're going to make the video 20 seconds, or the animation 20 seconds, and this is good, probably going to take about a minute to produce, because it's literally making this same plot 166 times, and then it's just going to play it over in a loop. So this is just kind of a fun animation. I don't know if you guys have got this to run yet. But it's just showing the variation of that DRC value over time throughout that whole study period. And then permit detections are kind of just flashing in and out of the different sites. It's, this is more for fun, not so much for, for real science. But So we got about five minutes left. The last little bit of this code is just um, applying that correction factor to the to the number of permit detections in the system. Um, it's pretty simple. We don't really need to run through it too much. It's going to produce those exact same plots that um, that we saw in the presentation and are in the paper. Just run right through. Huh? Interesting. Anyone else get that error? The stat summary. Anyways, again, as I said before, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this application in terms of just correcting your number of detections. I think that DRC value has a lot better applications in terms of modeling stuff. But all the all the tools are here to, you know, if you go out the field and collect that data and you've got all this R code to run it, you should be able to, to work through, I think, um, pretty reasonably. And so, um, yeah, that's the method. I'm, I hope you guys find it useful. I hope you continue to work on it and develop it. Um, appreciate your feedback. And again, there's lots of great code on this. If you go to my GitHub page, you go to the OTN page, there's lots of good stuff um, for these types of analyses. So thank you all for your attention.